Hi, this is Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. We're holding by our 35th installment of the Torah portion of the week. We're holding by Parshas Nasso. Parshas Nasso happens to be the longest uh, Parsha in the in the entire Torah. It's uh, 176 verses. So an interesting thing here. The Torah says, uh, beginning of chapter 5, uh, beginning of chapter 5, uh, verse 5, it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. A man or woman who commits, who commits any of man's sins by committing treachery towards Hashem, that person shall become guilty. They shall confess their sin that they, shall, that they committed, shall make restitution for his guilt and its principal amount, and add its fifth to it and give it to the one who, whom he is indebted. So the Torah here says, that a person, man or woman, doesn't matter, who sins, right, commits a sin from whatever, from whatever sins it is, um, commits treachery towards Hashem. Now here is interesting. The the Hebrew language uh, is important to to understand here. It says Mikol Chatois Hadam Limo Maal Bashem. Does any sin, any transgression, uh, chataos or chatos means sins of ha'adam, of a person, limo ma'o ba'ashem. A little bit hard to translate. Uh, translated here is by committing treachery. The word ma'al, mem ayin lamit, um, in Hebrew is normally known as, known as uh, me'ilo. Right? What is me'il? It means you take something consecrated to the temple and you misuse it. You misappropriate it. So, let's say uh, a sacrifice was was given to the temple or funds were given to the temple and it's used for something else. Used for, you know, something not for, you know, certainly not for something that is, you know, that is holy for the sake of the temple. If you misuse it, it's called me'ila. So a sacrifice could be like that. Money used for the temple could be like that. Other things could be like that. So here the Torah says, if you do any sin, if a person does any sin, right, he commits treachery towards God. And they are guilty. Right? He commits me'ila. Now, if he sins, the question is, what? <laughs> what me'ila? What me'ila is is there? What is the connection? What is the connection of a person's sins to the temple, right? The misusing temple property. So says Mori Verebi, a rabbi going to Moshe Star Moshlita, maybe well. He says that when it comes to misappropriating. Um, sanctified things to the temple. Here, what it means, I mean, you can take that literally, and that's what it means. But here he says that each person has a holy soul, a holy and pure soul inside them. And it has the status of a holy vessel. So if you sin, if a person transgresses, that's as if the vessel i.e. the soul that's in the body, the holy soul that's in the body, you, it's like you're misappropriating it, you know, the holiness of that. That means that this holy soul, where does it come from? It comes uh, from above. It comes from God's heavenly throne. When God puts decides to put the soul inside a body, um, and then it says that if a person does any of these sins, it means anything that a person does. We might think of certain transgressions that a person may do. We may look at it as only if he did it on purpose. But here he says that means even if he did something by accident. Even if he did something by accident, he misappropriates the holy soul that he has. It's as, it's as if the holy soul, the vessel of his holy soul, gets misappropriated. And it causes a blemish. 
It causes a blemish to the soul. Now, it's interesting that I could understand if you do something on purpose. Do something on purpose, it's premeditated. Okay, that's easier to understand. If you do it by accident, now in this case, ignorance isn't bliss. Over here, you weren't careful. You backed up against the light switch on Shabbos, let's say, and you turned it off, or you turned it on. Ah, you did it by accident. So we don't throw the book at you necessarily for doing it by accident. By doing it by accident, you did something. Right? You were negligent. So negligence doesn't mean you get a free pass. Negligence means you got to pay a price that's going to be a much lower price to pay for than if you had done something on purpose. Now, he brings down further, and we're going to, and you know, we're going to develop this idea uh, a little bit. He brings down from the Vilna Gon, from Elijah Vilna, it says in Proverbs chapter 13, explains over there, King Solomon says that God, uh, if a person, for instance, does a sin by accident, it means that a person's soul was already blemished. In other words, it's an impossibility to do something by accident if your soul wasn't already blemished. Now this is a uh, this is a pretty pretty radical idea. I mean radical in you know quotation marks radical radical in the sense that if I do something on purpose, I understand right there's intention even if he, even if he doesn't know what he's doing per se, there's intention. So wherever the person's holding at that time, he'll get judged for doing something intentional, which the punishment is more severe. He does something by accident, we shouldn't punish him as much. And he'll be punished, but he won't be punished as much as we explain. Now the whole question the Vilna Gon asks over there from that verse and Proverbs is going to be, how is it that a person could possibly do something by accident. If the soul is really that pure and that holy, and it goes in the body, regardless of whether the body traps it, imprisons it, doesn't allow it to shine, right? The only time it's going to be allowed to shine is in the next world. Uh, you know, after a person dies, it will stay in the, you know, it'll get his just reward. And it'll be in a waiting position until uh, resurrection. So it'll get its right place in the next world. Hopefully, it did you know many good things in this world. And it'll be in a, like a way station until until it reunites with the body by resurrection. So the soul, as powerful as it is, is trapped by the body. And therefore, there's a struggle between body and soul, right? The constant struggle between physical and spiritual, and it and it goes through the entire person's life. Um, be that as it may, when the when a person sins, so both body and soul sin. The soul can blame it on the body. Body can blame it on the soul. It's irrelevant. Both body and soul uh, transgress. And when a person dies, God's going to judge both of them together. And the reason he's going to judge both of them together is because each one cannot be a viable source without the other. The soul can say, well, what do you want from me? The, you know, the body trapped me. The body will say, what do you want from me? The soul is the one that controls me. So God's going to slap them both together. And he's going to judge both of them. So when a person sins, the Talmud says a person only sins if it enters his mind something foolish. You're going to say, what, I, you know, I made a mistake, I wasn't careful yet, you were, you were foolish, you weren't paying attention when you should have been. You know, our goal is to always tune in to our spiritual side, while the body doesn't make that so easy. The body is dragging the soul all over the place, putting it in a different kind of positions, you know, throwing things at it, so to speak. 
And the soul, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, if it doesn't get nourished, the soul gets weakened. If the soul gets stronger by performing spiritual acts, the body, through the soul, performs spiritual acts, it strengthens the soul and it weakens the body to a certain extent. It weakens desire to do other things to go astray. Now, it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. Um, as, as it's brought down, a person is not in this world who's never sinned. Right, a person who's been in this world is not possible. They're not possible that they've never sinned. Now that being said, that being said, the the soul should have the ability to overpower the body. But again, there's that constant there's that constant struggle. So says the Vilna Gon. The Vilna Gon says that a person cannot transgress. Right, transgress, I guess, sounds better than sin, I guess. Tra a person cannot transgress something by accident had they not been already blemished. In other words, had they not done something on purpose, with intention, right, that's what purpose me on purpose means, he does it with intention, and the reality is it's really a a merit, a uh, a fight uh, against God, pretty much a rebellion, literally. It's like rebelling against God. So even if he doesn't know what he's doing, it's still called a rebellion, right? Even if he never learned that much or anything, it's still called a rebellion, whether whether he knows or he doesn't know, right? That's what it is. Again, he's not going to be punished as much. That's for sure. You know, unless there are other circumstances where he could have known and he didn't want to know and, you know, other other potential situations. Be that as it may, he's going to pay a price, right? He's definitely going to pay a price. So the villain going says that in order for someone to do something by accident, you must have done something on purpose. You must have done something that's premeditated that opened up your soul in order to sin by accident because if the soul itself with the body if the, if it wasn't blemished before then a person shouldn't be able to do something by accident in other words the vessel that you use that you've been given i.e. the soul the pure soul that's in the body had it done what it's supposed to do at all times and it, and it hadn't sinned up until this point. There's no way you can make a mistake. It's an impossibility. So says the Vilna Gaon, the fact that a person opened himself, opened himself up to sin already, he's already done something on purpose. Because he's done something on purpose, he's already opened himself up to do something by accident. This is an unbelievable, unbelievable novel idea. Um, so here, how does it fit in? Here, the Torah says, if a person sinned, it's like he, it's like he misused sanctified property to the temple. Now here, my Rebbe explains that what's a sanctified property? It's your soul. The soul is considered a vessel, a holy vessel. This holy vessel, you could say, is sanctified to the temple, to God. Right? It's this holy vessel. Now, if you misuse this holy vessel, that's called me'ila. That's called misappropriation of something spiritual. Ah, you tell me it was never really sanctified to the temple. Right? But it, nonetheless, it comes from a holy place. It comes from God's heavenly throne. It comes from this soul world. Because it comes from the soul world and it's holy, you misuse it, you misappropriate it, so to speak, fall underneath this category. It's called be'ila. It's called misappropriating something that's holy, that was given for the temple. Here, the soul is given to do mitzvahs. That's what its purpose is. It's there 
to come close to God, because that's where it comes from. Right? And Maria points out, and everyone else corroborates this, it's chelek elokam ma'al. It's a portion or a part from God from above. So when God breathed in the spirit of life, he breathed in this soul to man. Any time a child is born, the soul goes in. No question if it goes in time of conception or after. That's a whole discussion. But the idea is that the soul has been misappropriated. Now, we can make this a little more graphic. The soul, as we mentioned, comes from God himself. If it comes from God itself, it should want to tap into the, into the holiness, the spiritual of this world. Ah, you tell me we said you get stuck in the body. So it's a struggle between body and soul. That's true. But you see, you, got, you have to nourish the soul. You have to give it something. You have to give it spirituality. If you don't give it spirituality, it dies. I mean, it doesn't die. It's, it's immortal. But it just gets weaker and weaker. It doesn't mean no matter what it's done, it doesn't have the ability to shine. A person can be steeped in so much garbage he needs a snorkel in order to breathe. That may be true. But he still has the spark. Even if that spark is like this big, it can still be reunited. Ah, you tell me. It's like starting a Jeep with a 9 volt. <laughs> you know, trying to start up. It's not going to go. Right, some people need like a nuclear bomb to go off over their head and that'll wake them up. Most people, you know, most people don't wake up their entire lives. You know, the, the old statement goes, some people think, some people think they think, some people rather die than think. Right? Most people don't want to think. They're not interested in what their purpose in the world is. They just sort of go with the flow. Whatever, wherever the world takes them, that's what they do. They don't, you know, they, they don't think things out. Things are haphazard, etc. So th this is an amazing idea that what we do matters. Because if God gave everyone a purpose, and that soul zoop, goes into the body. It's probably been here more than once, so it's probably the last time it's going to be here in order for it to reach whatever potential it is. You know, this is sort of the, the last, the last shot as it as it goes. Nonetheless, the goal is to tap into the spiritual. That is the purpose. In other words. We're all messengers to a certain extent. We're given certain strengths, certain weaknesses, and we're supposed to use them in order to reach whatever our higher level of potential is. But the scary thing is, is that if we don't, and we weaken the soul, but weakening the soul means you go, you go towards the body. You let the body take over. So if you let the body take over, and the spiritual side just goes by the wayside, so you've misappropriated your soul. Now in the bigger scheme of things, in this upside-down, topsy-turvy world that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we look at it, plenty of things don't make any sense, one thing is for sure. A right, person is made up of body and soul. So, using the soul to strengthen the body, that's our goal. Ah, you weren't brought up with it. Ah, your family doesn't practice it. Or whatever the case is. Well, God gave you a brain. When God breathed in the spirit of life, gave you the ability to make decisions. So, you can make good decisions, you can make bad decisions, but we have free will. Nobody's holding a gun to our head and say, oh, eat this piece of bacon or I'm going to kill you. No one's doing that. You just you decide, you know, to eat that piece of bacon. That's your choice. Right? As a Jew, that's your choice. But you're going to say, well, if I grew up like that and I didn't know any better. So, yeah, if you grew up as a potato farmer in Idaho, no offense to any people who grew up in Idaho or are potato farmers. Nonetheless, so, you didn't know. 
Maybe you'll say it's an impossibility for you to have known. Maybe. So God's going to look at it like you did things by accident. Like all the things that you did, you transgressed. Like by accident. You're not doing it as a rebellion. You're doing it because you don't know any better. You see, not knowing any better doesn't get you out of the problem. It just means the punishment is going to be less. But let's say that if we look at the, the bigger in the bigger scheme of things and we see that everyone's connected everyone's connected online for better or for worse right? not too many people not connected if you're connected online it's almost an impossibility not to find things out about Judaism I mean you could obviously miss it you can obviously not search for it and not have an interest in it, that's true. But to say that you don't know what it is because you never came in contact with it, it can't happen. I'm not saying it's an impossibility. Right? But for most people, for most people, they've come in contact with Judaism. Right? Most Jews have come in contact with Judaism. So we can't say, well, you didn't know. You might not have had a, pro a proper education, meaning a proper Jewish education. That may be true. And the vast majority of Jews may, you know, that may be the case. See, but at the same time, there's so much information out there to say that, you know, I didn't know, I couldn't have known, it was an impossibility for me to know. It's a little bit hard to say. There are people, don't get me wrong, there are people that if the parents hid their Jewishness from them, they would never know that they were Jewish. Alright, so they'll... they'll even get cut more slack because for them it was an impossible impossibility to know. Now non-Jews are not, you know, we'll we'll, sing, we'll single you out now. Non-Jews ignorance isn't bliss either. Okay, you were brought up in the church, you were brought up as a Hindu, brought up as a Buddhist, or whatever the case is. But also God gave you a brain, also breathed in the spirit of life. The soul may not be as the same as a Jew, but you know the 614th commandment it means don't be stupid. 615th commandment, one of my favorites, don't be a moron. Why? The reason is, is because it doesn't matter if you were brought up that way. God wants more. He expects more. He wants you to think. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't it make sense? Right? One of the no eyed laws is you, can't, you cannot go according to idolatry. You cannot be an idolater. So they say, well, how's a person supposed to know that? That's a good question. But again, you know, there, there are hundreds, thousands of people that are coming out of Christianity. You know, the main reason is because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There are contradictions, all kinds of things, and eventually they leave. Now they're coming out in droves. So, if they could see it, it doesn't matter how long it took them. If they could see that, don't other has, others have the same responsibility? They're also given the soul. So their soul's also crying out. It just got stuck. You know, it got stuck in this body that, you know, brought up by a Christian family or by a Buddhist family or, you know, whatever. It doesn't mean they have to convert. For sure they don't have to convert, but they have to keep the laws according to the Torah, according to what they need to do as non-Jews. All right, they can keep more, they can keep less. You know, there's many more than seven Noahide laws, right? That's not the topic for now. But even for them, they should be striving to want to have this connection. Again, even if it doesn't mean that they convert, because we're not looking for converts. We're not interested in people converting. Ah, you want to convert, you believe it's the absolute will of God, and you do whatever it takes to get to the other side. In order to be a Jew, that's one thing. We're not looking for that. You want to do it, and it's all or nothing, and you'll be the best convert you can be, you know, to be the best Jew you can be, okay. You know, we'll sit, we'll discuss it. You know, you'll have to learn, you have to go through the process of conversion, but you don't have to. You can have a portion of the world to come. You know, even holding by the seven Ohio laws. So you might say, well, maybe it's not a big of portion as it is for a Jew. That may be true. But if God wanted everyone to be Jewish, they would be. Everyone would be keeping the laws. It'd be, it'd be universal. But it's not. So there's an option. You don't have to. You can still eat shrimp. 
right? You can still eat, you know, swordfish, other things, you know, that aren't kosher. It doesn't matter. You want to keep kosher, you can. Obligation? Absolutely not. If you do it, you get married. Fine. Right? But it doesn't mean you have to be a Jew. The point is, it's a universal thing that everybody has to know. I guess that's why I'm emphasizing it. Is the fact that God gave you a soul. Everybody's got a soul. Some have more parts of the soul. The Jews have more parts than the non-Jews. Certainly than more than animals. Right? Animals only have the animalistic soul. Which is basically just programmed DNA. Can't go outside their own program. But man is not like that. We have free choice. Can make good choices. Can make bad choices. But the bottom line is, even for a non-Jew, which is going to be shocking to most people, even by a non-Jew, you can misappropriate your soul as well. I, these commands of sacrifices and this, is, is talking about a Jew. That's all. That's true. But we can apply it to a non-Jew equally as well. And the reason is very simple, because they also have that spark. They also have the soul that's given from God, so... They also have the fight between good and evil inside them. So they have to know what to do for themselves. So you'll say, Rabbi, but how can you say, you know, for me, you know, and you grew up in, you know, in the sticks, in the boonies, as we used to say, or still say, uh, in Boston, or the boondocks for other people, whatever the case is. If you grew up in the middle of nowhere, how in the world were you supposed to know? Again, Jew and non-Jew, ignorance isn't necessarily bliss. For a Jew, we'll cut them a little bit of slack. You'll still pay a price. For a non-Jew, it's worse. For a non-Jew, you do the wrong thing. You, you transgress the seven Ohide laws. Any of those laws you transgress, you don't have to be warned. Death penalty. So you say, well, if I'm already, you know, if I was a Christian for so long and that's considered idolatry, according to most rabbinical authorities, then I'm already a dead man, right? So you say, well, how do I get out of it? Good luck. How do you get out of it? Tshuva. Repentance. If it's done sincerely, you can override it. Otherwise, no non-Jews would be allowed to convert. No non-Jews would be allowed to be Noahites. If they're liable for the death penalty, they're just lacking kfur. They're just lacking burial. They're sort of walking around, but they're already dead. So obviously we don't hold that. Because otherwise no one would be allowed to convert. So as we see, this is complicated. Right? The, the soul is complicated. Where it comes from is complicated. The whole thing is complicated. But the thing we have to keep in mind you know, and what we have to do is that what we do matters. So if I do something by accident, and again, this is really the punchline. So to speak, if I do something, a person does something by accident, it means his soul was already blemished. Now, what does that mean exactly? When we say the soul was blemished, it doesn't mean it's totally evil. We don't say, well... You're inherently evil, and, you know, that's it. You have no hope. Well, if you're a Christian, you got plenty of hope because everything is evil. And therefore, thank God, this person came down for all your sins, so you don't have to do anything. That makes life very easy. Confess here and there, did this thing, that thing, but he's already here to sacrifice for you. Very, very easy religion to be a part of. Because you don't have to do anything. There's no, there's no repercussions. You're already bad, so whatever you do is bad. And you just, you know, blow it off to him. You know, guy hanging on a stick. So you blow it off on him. He takes everything. I don't have to do anything. That's beautiful. You know, obviously Judaism doesn't believe in that. Judaism believes about ultimate responsibility comes from you. So we're the ones that have to pay the price because we're the ones that do the action. You know, but when we look at it in these terms, you know, it's a pretty scary thing. But if there would be no ability to repent, 
There would be no ability to do tshuva. That's it. Non-Jews wiped off the face of the map. Can't convert. Can't become no eyes. You're dead. Sorry. <laughs> Bye. That's it. That wouldn't be fair. At the same time, since we give them the ability to do tshuva and to repent, the ignorance that they have, you know, we don't give them a free pass. So what they don't know is held against them. They finally see the light. They learn something. Oh, the thing about the seven Noahide laws or more than that. You know, they're in depth. I have to know about them, what to keep, what I'm allowed to keep, not allowed to keep. Be that as it may, you repent, you're still, you know, you're still on the ball field. If there's no such thing as repentance, you're not even on the ball field. You're just, you're not even in the batter's box. You're like, you're not even on the bench. You're not even a bench warmer. You're not in the ballpark at all. <laughs> you're, you're busy buying hot dogs outside. You have no connection. So therefore, we all have to tap in. You know, at whatever level. A Jew at his level, a non-Jew has to do what he has to do. But it's very hard. It's very hard in this day and age to say, I, you know, I couldn't have known. It was an impossibility for me to know. Very hard to say that. There are people, don't get me wrong, there are people out there that, again, grew up as potato farmers in Idaho, have no idea, totally closed off. So you say those people are going to be less held accountable. True. You know, or they never knew that they were Jewish. Or whatever the case is. But there's, a, there's an obligation to use your brain. There's an obligation to look in the world, what am I doing here? What's my, what are my goals? Either physical goals or spiritual goals. God didn't make you a rock. He gave you the ability to make decisions. You gave the ability to reason. You can make the wrong decisions. You could flush your spiritual life down the toilet, which most people do. It's your choice. But remember, even if it's your choice, you make the decision. You make the bed that you lie in. Because at the end of 120 years, we're going to have to explain what we did and why. And God's going to say, did you learn Torah? Did you keep its laws? Did you do what you were supposed to do? So you say, well, how was I supposed to know? God's going to say, how are you supposed to know? Most Jews today know somebody. Let's come back to Torah. There's somebody in some family they know. Even if they themselves don't want to look into Judaism or give it lip service or whatever, they know somebody's come back to Torah. They, they have a connection to somebody Somehow that, you know, has come back. You know, reconnected that link in the chain to the giving of the Torah Mount sign. It doesn't matter if the parents didn't keep it, their siblings didn't keep it. But you don't have to go back too many generations where you're going to have relatives that did, that were great people. So even if you don't know what your genealogy is, most people know somebody. You know, somebody from some family. Doesn't matter, relative, not, friend, whatever it is. So it's almost an impossibility to say, there's no way I could have known. Here's just the opposite. Let's say a person knows they have a, you know, they have a friend they grew up with. And then that friend, you know, becomes an Orthodox Jew. They may not have anything to do with them anymore. Whatever the case is, but... 
If they want to know, they're able to find out. They can turn their, you know, turn their head, <laughs> turn it this way, that way up. They can, they can ignore reality. But they know there is such thing. Again, even if they don't, let's say, know someone personally. You know, there is a reality. They choose not to find out about it. I, they don't know anything. They don't want to know anything. That's considered rebellion, whether how much you know or not. And to say, well, there was an impossibility for me to find out, that's not necessarily true. Most people will not have that excuse. There will be a few people say, oh, but I know this one and that one that had absolutely no idea, no connection. You could, you could bring proofs against that. That's fine. You know, the vast majority, they know somebody. I had a story. I'll tell you an interesting story. Right? Scare a little bit. Scare everyone. I should have made a, a announcement at the beginning that if you're watching this late at night, <laughs> might not be a good idea. Anyway, I had a story. Someone I knew growing up. Someone I knew growing up had no connection to Torah. I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure they went to synagogue, even on the high holy days. Very little. Very little, if anything. The person died shortly after I got married. And again, no connection whatsoever. Came to me in a dream. Now, you might say, oh, you can't tell about dreams. Right? Most dreams don't mean anything. That's true. You know, most dreams are just, you know, what we went through during the day and it manifests itself in different ways. Most dreams, according to the Torah, really don't mean anything. There are certain dreams that are significant, but most dreams, you know, you shouldn't worry about it. It certainly doesn't mean anything. Uh, maybe I'll one day speak more in depth about that. But anyway, I had a dream. And this person came to me in a dream. And this person said, you know, I should have listened, I didn't listen, I didn't have connection, you know, etc. He knew who I was. He knew where where I came from and what I was doing with my life at that time. Still didn't, you know, didn't change any aspect of his life, per se, but came to me in a dream and said, you know, the gates of heaven are closed, I can't get in. Now, from... What I know about other things, if a person doesn't prepare in this world, i.e. you don't prepare Arab Shabbos, you don't prepare for Shabbos, you don't get to eat on Shabbos. Right? You don't prepare in this world, spiritually. So what kind of portion of the world to come are you going to have? Ah, you tell me every Jew has a portion of the world to come. Yeah, but then there's a lot of commentary on who loses their portion or potentially loses their portion. Doesn't mean you have a smaller portion. It means you could lose your entire portion. Be that as it may, this story sheds light, a drop. Because he says, I couldn't get in. It was an, it's an impossibility. I can't get in. You know, do something to help me. So, you know, I woke up in like a, you know, I woke up in a sweat. So, I spoke to one of my rabbis about it and said, what you should do is um, learn in their merit. You know, say their name, Hebrew or English, if you know his Hebrew name, fine. If you don't know his Hebrew name, you just say his English name. Say, this is a merit for this soul. You know, learn for them, you know, certain things. And give a, a small token every time, you know, you learn for their, you know, for their soul. As, you know, to give to charity, right? To give to stuff. You give whatever, small token. It doesn't have to be a lot. And you say, I'm doing, I'm giving in the merit of this soul, you know, should have an aliyah, should have, a, you know, an uplift in its soul, you know, and, you know, you mention the name and you put the money in for charity. So, so you say, well, very nice. What happened? So months went by. You know, I didn't have this, you know, not, it didn't seem like anything, um, you know, anything happened. But I continued to do um, what my rabbis told me to do. So I would say three, four months later, maybe, maybe even more, less than half a year went by and he came back to me in a dream looking totally different than he did. And he thanked me and said, the gates are now open because of what you did, I was able to enter. Now, the story is significant, A, because it happened to me, 
So, you know, it's got to mean something. But it's significant because he was, a, he was a person. And again, as far as I knew, you know, he had, a, he had very little connection, you know, to anything Jewish. You know, it was very Jewish in other ways. But not a connection to, you know, going to synagogue. You know, not so much a connection, certainly, you know, to keeping mitzvahs, um, etc. So, somebody like that had basically no connection to Torah in this world comes to you in a dream. <laughs> if this happens, you know, call me, we'll discuss it. Comes to you in a dream and says, I should have listened, you were right. You know, I shouldn't have mocked, I shouldn't have this, and I'm paying the price, I can't get in. That's significant. It's significant because the person's coming back and admitting that there's absolute truth. They're admitting it because they're embarrassed what happened to them. We don't want that. So in that case, <coughs> this person could have found out if he was interested. All right, this is still when you know the internet was in its infancy. You know, it was barely email back then when it happened. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless. You know, where this person lived, there were Orthodox synagogues in the area. And so we could have found out if you wanted to. But he admitted, as far as my memory goes back, he admitted he should have looked into it, he didn't, he's paying a price. It's a pretty steep price. All of eternity not having a connection to it whatsoever. So you could ask, what does learning for someone's soul do? Ooh. We don't have time for that either. A lot of good questions, no answer. Sorry, gotta go. Say like this. You know, when we learn something and we say something, you make a blessing. Or we'll talk about learning. Learning, learning's better. You know, you learn a certain text, whatever it is, and you learn it out loud. Every word that you say, you get credit for. That's what Talmud Torah, learning Torah is. Right? It should be learned out loud. Also, if you think clearer, you know, going through it. But it should be learned out loud, not necessarily to yourself. Not like, you know, you're sitting in a library and they're going, shh. Right? It should be learned out loud and spoken out so you can understand it better. But see, every word that you say, you know, that's like, you know, it's like a cash register, a spiritual cash, cash register going off. Ka-ching, 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 right? That's spiritual merit. That's, you know, being, being put to the side for you in the next world. So, imagine what that merit is. Well, I mean, we can't imagine. You know, as my Rebbe always says, and I always say it as well, I've never met anyone in that world to ever come back. Well, I've had some dreams here and there, but... You know, no one has actually come back and lived on this earth, you know, after death. But the idea is that, that if we learn in somebody's merit, either after they're died, or even when they're still alive, let's say they're very sick, but you learn in their merit, it can help them. Because Torah is a mugging. Torah protects. So if you use that and you use that merit for somebody else, for whatever, for sickness, or to help their soul in the next one, whatever the case is, it's got power to do that. There are many, many stories. Many, many stories. You know, that I've read of, of the power of learning and what it does to a future soul. Right? A, a, sorry, a soul in the next world. So that's the reason they said, you know, these rabbis told me, you know, learn in their merit. Or this rabbi told me, learn in his merit. Give charity is also a good thing. You know, in their merit, so they have merit. Now you're going to say, how can you transfer that merit? It's also a good question. How it works practically, you know, I have to turn each other into uh, Kabbalists here. 
you know, to understand how that works. Let's just say for argument's sake it does. Right? We'll take it at face value. If I do that, it can help somebody. Either in this world to get better. It doesn't always work, but you know, a person has a death decree on them, then it doesn't matter what you're gonna do. Right? They're not gonna help them now. Um, you know, you can that, that merit no it never goes to waste. May not, you know, help them in this world, help them in the next. Nonetheless, it's got power. It's got such power we don't, you know, we can't even fathom what that is. So in this case, it would seem that there was a difference between what the soul was going through before and, and what it's going through now, you know, a, a, after the fact. Though what it done, what it did was over that amount of time. You know, the spiritual cash register was going ka-ching, 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 and was offsetting whatever terrible things it did in this world. Offsetting in the sense that, you know, didn't have enough merits to get into the next world. The gates were shut. Can that happen? It can happen. Okay, I had a dream. I read other things. You know, that, that bear that out. The dream only confirmed, you know, confirmed that. So even so. Well, what, what, what's the point of the story? The point is, is that this person may have been ignorant, had no connection to Torah, but knew someone that did. Didn't take advantage of it. Didn't want to learn, didn't want to know. And the next world paid a price. Paid a very severe price. And at that point, until it came to me in a dream, was a no man's land. So to speak. His soul couldn't get fixed up enough. Get purged enough to have his own portion of the world to come because of what he did in this world. Stagnant. Not even stagnant. He's not getting in. He's not even a bench warmer. He's not even in the ballpark. And that could be spiritually forever. All because he had no connection to Torah. Didn't want a connection to Torah and he paid a price. So you're going to say, okay, I know the story and there are probably other stories like that in other cases. True. So where's my free will? So you can listen to this video and go back to eating bacon or do whatever you want. No, no one's forcing you to do anything. Makes you think, though. Yeah, if someone at that level, if someone at, you know at that level couldn't get in because he had no connection, and he had more of a direct connection than someone who was close to the family that, you know, could have potentially helped them. You know, they weren't interested. So you say, well, ignorance is bliss. Mm. <laughs> it's a scary proposition. Because you turn aside, you know, once you see what the truth is, or you turn aside not no, you're not caring what the truth is, it's going to be what to pay, pay for. It could result... And not having a portion of the world to come. Now, if he would have kids, that would go in the way of Torah. That would be a merit for him. Well, he doesn't. He has one child, but certainly not going in that direction. So he doesn't have that merit. So his his soul can't, you know, go up in you know in spirituality because he's got no connection to this world of people doing, you know, people that are directly related to him that are. You know, doing any mitzvahs that can help his soul directly. So it could be, that's why it came to me. Food for thought. Point being, is that the soul that's given comes from a very high place. If we misuse it, it's called me'ila. It's called not using Something that's holy. You're misappropriating the soul. 
If you misappropriate the soul, and you choose not to look into things, when you could have, you pay a much more severe price. The price you may ultimately pay is you're still knocking on the door. Hey, what's the combination? You're knocking on the door. And when you knock on the door and there's no answer, and that's for eternity or until something else happens, we never want to be in such a situation. I also give a class once a week on this topic and other topics in my intro to Kabbalah based on the book Derek Hashem. It's every Tuesday night, 9 o'clock. Um, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 9 o'clock New York Time. Um, I also give conversion classes, Noahide classes. Take a look at my Facebook fan page, Beyond Orthodox Conversion to Judaism, or uh, Beyond Noahides. You can look at my, you can look at my blog at orthodoxconversion.com. Anyone wants to contact me, can contact me at rabbichaimkaufman at gmail.com, R-A-B-B-I-C-H-A-I-M-C-O-F-F-M-A-N at gmail.com. Everyone have a great Shabbos.